Bhagavato Sama Samudasa Namutasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namutasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Sadhu Sabhu Sadhu this one is really fun because this sutta is an example of how the Buddha was teaching the, uh, the common man, the common person at the time. And um, so it has a lot of pieces in it. This is a, a really good example of how he taught with similes. And um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to go over here to the uh, screen here, let's see the share screen. And we want to have a board, a whiteboard. And, um, and then I want to just write down the parts of this as it starts in the beginning so that you can follow them precisely. And there's going to be a step-by-step -step uncovering of suffering in this sutta that really explains to you how you make yourself suffer. It's really cool the way this works. Um, so let me start here and we will do this. And we have to, um, whoops, let's see if we can get rid of that. I just made that one go. Okay. We have the drawing and we're going to make it red. Okay, so you have in the story, you have a knife. Okay, so the first thing you have is you have a, um, a knife. And all through the story, you have this knife. Okay, and um, let's see, pull this down here. The knife is going to uncover something. We find an object in the beginning, and obviously the name of the sutta is the Ant Hill Sutta. It's called Vamika, the Vamika, Vamika Sutta. And it means the ant hill. If, you've, if you haven't seen an ant hill in the jungle, um, these ant hills, can get very, very, very large, maybe a half a foot or a foot high. We're not talking about the um, the one that eats the wood. What's that? The um, oh, you know, the one that eats the wood. Yeah, we're, it's not. We're not talking about a termite nest. This is an ant hill, and the ant hills are really big. They can be six inches to a foot high sometimes. When I was at, at Deep Hand Car, they had one that was seven inches high. And I used to go up there and see what happened if I took a stick and poked it in. <laughs> and then I stood up on the porch around the pagoda there um, and I watched what happened with the anthill. So when you poke an anthill with a knife, the first thing that is found in this story is a bar, a bar. Okay, and the next thing that found, is found in the story is a toad. And the next thing that found, he finds in, that is found inside is a fork. And the next thing that is found um, inside is a sieve. And I kind of forgot that I could use this pen. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> okay, the next thing that is found um, is a, uh, a sieve. And the next thing that is found is a tortoise. 
And the next thing that's found is a uh, butcher block. And um, a butcher, a butcher knife and block. I'm say block and knife. Okay, a butcher's block and knife. And the next thing that is found is a piece of meat. And the next thing that is found is a Naga serpent. Okay, so these are the things that you're gonna find inside the anthills are usually, the one that I was watching is kind of cool. It was, it was shaped like this. Had these little things from the rain all the way around it. And the ants would come in and they'd walk around and they would come up this mound to the top. And then it would come in like that. And it was like a mound, a mound that came up like this to the top. And it was like a hole in the top. So it didn't really look like much, but it was about like about four or five inches high total. And um, probably when it rained hard like this, it would all get washed down and then they would build it up again and again and again. That's what they would do. So you listen to the story when I do this. Um, I'm doing it out. Stop share. Okay. So you see that's what you're going to find. And then what happens is uh, they go to the Buddha to talk about this and they want to understand what exactly was happening uh, when this happened. So just listen to the story. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindigit's Park. Now on that occasion the Venerable Kumara Kasapa was living in the Blind Men's Grove. And then when the night was well advanced, a certain deity of beautiful appearance who is illuminated the whole of the blind men's grove. He approached the venerable Kumara of Kasapa and he stood at one side. And so standing, the deity said to him this, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, this ant hill fumes by night and flames by day. Thus spoke the Brahmin, delve with the knife, thou wise one, delving with the knife, the wise one saw a bar. A bar, O oh, venerable sir, Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the bar, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a toad. A toad, O venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the toad, delve with the knife, Thou wise one, delving with a knife, the wise one saw a fork. O venerable sir, thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the fork, delve with a knife, thou wise one, delving with a knife, the wise one saw a sieve. A sieve, O oh, venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin. 
Throw out the sieve. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Now delving with the knife, the wise one saw a tortoise. A tortoise, O oh venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the tortoise. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delve with the knife. The wise one saw a butcher's knife and block. A butcher's knife and block, O venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. Delve with the knife again, thou wise man. Delve with the knife. And the wise man, wise one, saw a piece of meat. A piece of meat, O oh venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out your piece of meat. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delve with the knife. And the wise one saw a Naga serpent. A Naga serpent, O oh venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. Monk, you should go to the Blessed One and you should ask him about this riddle. And as the Blessed One tells you, so should you remember it. Monk, other than the Tathagata, were a disciple of the Tathagata, or one who has learned it from them. I see no one in this world with the gods and its Maras and its Brahmas and its generation with the recluses and Brahmins, its princes and its people, whose explanation of this riddle might satisfy the mind. That is what was said by the deity, who thereupon just vanished, just at once. So then, when the night was over, the venerable Kumara Kasapa, he went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he told the Blessed One what had occurred. And then he asked, Venerable Sir, what is the anthill? What the fuming by night? What the fuming by day? Who is the Brahmin? Who the wise one? What is the knife? What is the delving? What the bar? What the toad? What the fork? What the sieve, what the tortoise, what the butcher's knife and block. What is this piece of meat? What the Naga serpent? Buddha said, Bhikkhu, the anthill is a symbol for this body, your body, made of material form, consisting of the four great elements. It's procreated by a mother and father, built out of boiled rice and porridge. And it's subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to disillusion, to disintegration. What one thinks and ponders by night based upon one's actions during the day that is the fuming of the night if you can't sleep it's because of what you're thinking about from the day the actions one undertakes during the day by body speech and mind after thinking and pondering by night 
is the fuming or the flaming by day. So the flaming is by day and the fuming is at night. And the Brahmin is a symbol for the Tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened. The wise one is a symbol for a bhikkhu in higher training. The knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. Remember what we said wisdom means? The delving is a symbol for the arousing of energy. The bar is a symbol of ignorance. Throw out the bar, abandon ignorance. Now delve with the knife, thou wise one. And this is the meaning. The toad is a symbol for anger and irritation. Mm. Throw out the toad, abandon anger and irritation. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The fork is the symbol for doubt. Throw out the fork, abandon doubt. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The sieve is a symbol for the five hindrances, namely the hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, this distraction of restlessness and remorse, and the disturbance of doubt. Throw out the sieve, abandon these five hindrances. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates. When affected by clinging, namely, the material form aggregate, if affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate, if affected by clinging, the perception aggregate, if affected by clinging, and the formations aggregate, if it's affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate, if it's affected by clinging. Throw out the tortoise, Abandon the five aggregates affected by clinging. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The butcher's knife and block is a symbol for the five cords of sensual pleasure. Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, <laughs> I keep wrestling. Amen. <laughs> Desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Right. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are desired, agreeable, and likable connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Odors sensed by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with desire and provocative of lust.
and the body that is likable, wished for, desired, and agreeable, connected with des sensual desire and provocative of lust. Now throw away the butcher's knife and block. Abandon the five cords of sensual pleasure. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is your meaning. Now the piece of meat is a symbol for delight and lust. Throw out the piece of meat and abandon delight and lust. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. And the Naga serpent is a symbol for the monk who has destroyed all of the taints. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. And this is the meaning. So it's quite a short sutta, but when we go back and we start to look at this one more time, we have to say a little bit more about each piece so we can really understand what exactly it's talking about in relationship to our practice. So let's look at it one more time. It's only two pages. It's quite amazing. You delve with a knife and a bar comes up. This was your ignorance. He said to abandon ignorance. So what are you doing? You are embracing the building of knowledge, not just through reading, not just through listening, but by pursuing knowledge and vision in your meditation. Throw out the bar, delve with the knife, and you come across a toad. Now let's see, who was the toad? <laughs> the toad is the second one. Ardika, you have to turn your mic on and help me with this. <laughs> you follow with your finger. I'll tell you what, you, my eyes are so tired. Who has the book? Bonte, do you have the book? Which books? <laughs> the book, and the Majima, Majima Nikaya. Go okay, down here. Okay, page, page 237, 237. 237. Yeah. You follow along and I'll, well, tell you where to go. I want you to remind me what the toad is. Where is it? Uh, oh, okay, the Wamika Sutta. Yeah, yeah, okay. So wait, where's the Buddha star here? Um, Number page four. Okay, just follow along with me. If I, I get despair here, my... uh, due to anger. Todd is despair due to anger. I'm sorry, what? Despair due to anger, Todd. The thought is a symbol for oh, anger the toad, and irritation. The toad? Okay, where's the toad? The annual he two, two, three, nine is on the page two, After three, nine. Minute. Okay, first we start at four. First, he's going to tell you, he's going to tell you about the anthill first. And here's what he says. It's made of material form consisting of four great elements procreated by the father and the mother, built up out of the boiled rice and porridge, and the subject is to impermanence. So this is your body. This is who you, this is the body structure, your shell. You know, your boat through life. This is what carries you through. One thinks and ponders by night based on your actions during the day. And this is the fuming by night. Well, that's pretty obvious, okay? Whatever happens to you during the day, do not think it's just happening in the present time and nothing else is coming of it. Don't make the mistake, because in our life, this is how the suffering catches you. Whatever you do for the day, that is what goes into your night. So if your mastery is good of the present time, that's okay. You're moving with the present time. But if your mastery is not good of the present time, you slip like most people, What's happening is whatever you did today 
will be the disposition of your night. So if you cannot sleep in the night, what is happening is you are fuming. You are having uh, the fuming happen at night. The actions that you take during the day with your body, speech, and mind after thinking and pondering by night, you slip into the next day and you keep going or as you go through your day, you are flaming through the day. You feed whatever is happening when you take it personally. And this is how this is, this, the taking something personally is kind of like at a blacksmith, you have a fire and you have the billows and you pump the air on the flame to make the flame hotter. Whenever you take things personally, that's what you're doing. Okay, that's what's happening. Now the Brahmin is the symbol for the Tathagata. Tathagata is another name for the Buddha. The Tathagata is another name for the Buddha, okay? Accomplished and fully enlightened. And the wise one, this is the noble wisdom. This is what the Tathagata is about that appeared in the story. Now the bar is the symbol of ignorance. Now we start the pieces. The bar is the symbol of ignorance. And he keeps saying, delve with the knife. Keep digging. You're hunting for the solution, the answers. This is the meaning. Keep delving with the knife and you will, it, the, if you delve with a knife in an anthill, well, it starts to collapse. And what you're collapsing here is your ignorance, okay? The toad is uh, the symbol for the anger, the, the, uh, the symbol for the anger, and you are to throw that away, the anger and irritation. And so what is TWIM doing when you're practicing TWIM? It helps you do that. And why does it help you do this? Is because when you're practicing the six R's, Every time you let go of the, of the fiery stuff and the suffering part, the anger and irritation, we tell you to do what? We tell you to laugh. We tell, you know, today I was trying to work with somebody in Australia. Try to remember, this is Tana. <laughs> okay, we have three different connections. We keep playing. You know, it's a good thing I keep going with this because the lesson is to keep delving with the knife. <laughs> and so you have to keep going until you have a good connection, no matter what. Now, what I was trying to show you was, every time you practice right effort, you are practicing four steps, okay? The first one is to recognize you're caught by the irritation and then the anger comes into it right very close that's the clinging the anger explodes it comes there the birth of it so you're recognizing the tension that's coming up with the anger and irritation then you let go of the attention on this why is that important when you let go of the attention on the irritation and the anger in, in your mind, you're letting go of, the, you're releasing everything in your body just relaxes. Why does that happen? I'm playing two parts here. I can do it with two voices if you want. <laughs> Why does that happen? <laughs> because when you let go of your intention on the irritation and the anger, you have a mind-body connection. Oh, what's that? Well, the mind-body connection was found by the Buddha. He explained it to the people. Mind is the forerunner of all states. All states are mind-made. Now, let's look at this for a minute. Let's play down here. See, let's, let's look at this. Okay, when, mm -hmm, right. Okay, 
what happens when you start to have suffering occur? First thing is tension. And then it turns into tightness. All of a sudden, something happens. I happen. <laughs> and I have an opinion about this because I, there is this painful feeling that came up. Let's do the painful feeling. Painful feeling. Then there is this I don't like it. And that is a big fat craving. And then what happens is your mind jumps into the story about why you don't like it and why you need to yell at this guy back. And if he hit you, why do you have to hit him back? And if he said an opinion, why do you have to fight with his opinion and make him listen to your opinion and all of that? Why do you have to do that? But that one is your clinging because you do it because you always do it. That's your story. Personal, personal story. You're getting deeper, deeper into trouble. Did you notice this, right? Here you go, see? Right? Unfortunately, we're not going down to the last step of the staircase to get the answer. This time, we're going down to the last step of the staircase to see how bad you're suffering. So here you are, you're in clinging. Now it's time for the birth of something. You are going to, you're going to, the birth of what? If somebody said something, somebody did something, somebody had an opinion you didn't like, when you are going through this process, What's happening? It's a birth of action? No, it's a birth of reaction. And you're not even going to think about what you're going to do. Most of the time, everybody out there is going to go bang. There it is. That's the reaction. And maybe it's a couple of minutes if it talk a lot like me. <laughs> I have to get my opinion in against your opinion and his opinion and all of that or something like that. Okay, but anyway, so that's, that's what happens. And the truth of it is when you look at this, when you see this tension and tightness, and then there's a painful feeling, and then there's I don't like it craving, right? And then there's the personal opinion story, and then there's the birth of reaction, and then you have the event just going along like this. And then what happens is you start feeling it. And if, it, if the event is, it's aging, this is the aging here, the aging, the aging event. And then it goes on and you go through the sorrow and the lamentation and the, pain, the um, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, right? And then what? Well, then you have the end. The end, that's the end of the movie. And then you do it again and again and again all day. And you'll find yourself, if you look and you watch, that your reactions are always the same way every single time. And this is because this is a habitual tendency in the human being and it lives in your head, in your library, and that's, where it's, that's what's happening. That's what, this, that's what this is happening. So this is actually looking in relationship to this sutta, this is looking at the dependent origination as it's happening, as the suffering is building up and, work, and happening here. Okay, we, we mix them up here. You can do contact up here if you want, contact and it has all this tension and tightness and then the painful feeling. This is looking at how dependent origination is your human cognition. That's what it is. So if you, why is it important for you to see this? It's not simple. I mean, it's just simple. If you cannot fix it, if you cannot see it, 
clearly what's happening. You have no chance, no chance of letting go at the right place. And the place you let go of to begin with is you let go with this birth of reaction. If you're going to cure this, you let go here first and just don't fight back but you still have this story in your in your head but the next time somebody does it to you you get to painful feeling i don't like it and blah 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 blah. hey 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 wait a second what's wrong i don't want to be like that anymore i'm not going to live with the story running and running and running the same way on me why do i have to live with the same reaction my whole life there's something wrong here. So you decide, I'm going to close the doors. You essentially are taking the library door, okay, and you're putting a big chain on it with a big padlock, and you're saying, boom, I have locked the door. My reactions are all in here, in the library, in my head, okay? I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, what happens? What am I going to do tomorrow when somebody says something and or does something and I, I get the same, the same tension and tightness, the same painful feeling, and I don't like it? Well, now you're going to see you don't like this. And as you feel the tension and the tightness in this painful feeling, you're going to do this. You're going to 6R. Somewhere in here, you're going to 6R. At first, when you start practicing, you're going to 6R way down in here. It's not going to be here. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be somewhere down here. Yeah. But as you become more sensitive, as you begin to understand that when you practice correctly, you begin to feel how light your head can feel when you're smiling more and more. Every time you smile, what happens with the smile? What happens with the smile, huh? The smile affects the head and it separates these two parts of the brain. There's the guy's brain, right? It separates them right here. And then what happens is this. Um, this part in here is your endorphins start to flow inside your head. When you tense these muscles just a little bit, when you tense those muscles just a little bit, right here, doesn't mean a big toothy grin, doesn't mean I have to feel happy to do this, doesn't have anything to do with feeling happy, has to do with just action in these muscles affecting your brain calming you down very quickly the more you smile the lighter you feel when you feel lighter when you feel lighter when this tension and tightness is rising you will feel it very quickly see this is how this is working so in the practices designed very scientifically the buddha was a genius with this he was a genius he saw the man here who was practicing, okay? And he's, he's kind of short. <laughs> you know, I love my drawing. I'm not going to win any, any awards with uh, my, my, he's practicing. And then there's this other person here. Uh, I need to make sure I don't give up my day job and pretend I can draw, oh my. <laughs> so this person is, is practicing here. And these two people, when they started to practice in the beginning, you know, uh, one of them had like, uh, they both had a lot of, um, let's pretend, they, they both, these people, they had a lot of tension in their head from the daytime. And they sit down to practice. Now, one of them is concentrating really hard. And when this uh, tension and tightness happens and a painful feeling. When that happens and it comes up, this person starts to push the, ten push the tension away or try to stop it, fights with the tension and tightness, 
and tries to make the the tension and tice. This is restlessness. This is restlessness, guilt, and remorse. This is sloth and torpor. This is lust and um, uh, attachment. This is hatred and uh, ill will. You know, hatred and aversion. Those. This is the way it's set up. You see. Now, these two people is very scientific. It's very scientific. These two people are here. Okay. This one is practicing the regular way. He sits down to meditate and maybe his meditation makes him a little less tension. We'll give him less tension. Here, let's give him some, uh, let's see, let's give him some orange, uh, give him some less tension here. His tension goes down here. But every time something comes up, he throws his up, he throws the hindrance away really hard. And then he comes right back here. And then he tries to meditate again. Now, what does the other one do? Oh, this guy is, oh, I came from, I know where you came from. I came from the school that he trim. Okay, you want to stay? You can stay. Okay, good. What happened? Well, what happens is when something comes up, okay, tell me what happens. What happens is uh, the pressure, it comes up, but when I, I release something, I release it, okay? And then I relax. So see, my, my tension and tightness was here. Now my tension and tightness is here when I start again, because I come, I smile and I come back and my head feels light. So when something heavy comes up, I can feel it. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's how it works. Well, it's very simple, isn't it? Yeah, it is simple and it makes me happy. I know, okay, thanks. <laughs> always wants to help my goodness okay but it's true i know it's true <laughs> okay so here's what's happening each time this person is practicing the twin practice he's practicing right effort he releases whatever came up he releases it and lets it go away he just leaves it alone he releases his attention on it and he relaxes each time he relaxes he goes down a little bit more. Next time, he keeps going and going. Finally, he gets into the jhanas. And then what happens is he loses feeling in his body. And then he gets very deep into mind and he's going through compassion and joy. And he's getting to uh, uh, the equanimity. And he's very, very quiet and he can't feel his body anymore. He has no concern. He has let go all of his concern for his hindrances. He has decided to trust the hindrances have nothing for him other than showing him that they happen without him asking them to. You see that? He's meditating. The hindrance comes up. He did not stop meditating and ask it to come up. It just came up. Remember how it works? You all experience this. So when it does come up, you, you simply relax. You let go. You, you let go of your attention. On it. You relax. And that relaxed step is letting go of the craving completely. It happens very fast. You, you, let, you let go, relax, smile, come back, and keep sending your loving kindness. You see? You do this all day long. Somebody gets mad at you when you do let go. You let go and you go, oh, <laughs> and you relax, smile, come back. Smile through it. They'll stop getting angry if you start smiling. I'll tell you a secret right now. That's how it works. And so this anger and this irritation, this suffering, you're healing it over and over again. You're telling your mind every time. I am going to just let you let go of it. Just let go of it like that. Let it fall away. Relax, smile, and come back again. Keep going straight. That's how it works. If you do that enough with your mind, your mind begins to trust you. It believes that this is what it should be doing. And then I have students that are already talking to me. 
now after one or two months and they're saying, wow, I, I don't bite back anymore. I just let go, relax, smile. And I try to remember I'm in a boat, <laughs> this body, and I'm just moving along. Don't get stressed out, don't need to. And then the fork goes in and, you, and, and is the symbol for the doubt. The problem is we have this doubt and this doubt is a problem boy. <laughs> when you have an old practice and you're practicing another way or you're trying to work with your meditation but you always think that people are concentrating hard and you must concentrate hard. You don't need all that concentration. When your concentration, you know, even if we go to Visuddhimagga in the very first page that talks about it, it's talking about something, it kind of forgets about it, but in first page it says, you have to develop a productive level of concentration. What do you think a productive level of concentration would be? Do you think a, a concentration that is a productive level is one that makes you very tight? narrow-minded, not able to consider anything else. You have to run your life like this all through your life. That's a exhaustion on your heart, exhaustion on your stomach, exhaustion on every organ in your body and your mind. Hurts your eyes, everything. Can hurt your hearing, everything. No, if, what did we say about the progress of the meditation? What did we say when the Buddha told Ananda about the modes of progress? He said the only one that was excellent was a um, comfortable meditation instead of painful, a comfortable meditation with clear comprehension is the only one that is excellent progress. That's what you're trying to do. Understand very clearly what was happening with this practice in life. How does it affect life? You know, you know, I, it's difficult because sometimes people think, well, only the monks are the ones that progress and we're just take care of them and they'll just keep progressing. And that, I'm sorry. The reason it still exists is because the people learned something and they had kept enough pieces of it, the loving kindness, the compassion, and certain parts of it, it's still around. When you go back and see, what did he show them? Oh my, what he showed them. Four steps inside the Eightfold Path. Three folds is all it really is showing the practice itself. It's showing you four steps of right effort recognize the unwholesome mind state release the unwholesome mind state relax your mind smile okay and that's the bringing up the wholesome mind state the moment you smile it's the instant light wholesome mind state and then you keep that wholesome state going and do it again do it again Play it again, Sam. There's an old song. You think I'm wrong. We'll play it again. Play it again, Sam. That's an old song. See? Play it again, Sam. And you play it again and play it again and play it again. All of a sudden, you come to me and you say, somebody was yelling at me who always gets me upset. And you know what? I decided to just give them a lot of compassion and send them a lot of loving kindness. I didn't get upset at all. My mind just did it. I didn't even have to think about it. In fact, the first time it happened, it happened after I even thought about it because your, your brain figured out, hey, <laughs> this is comfortable. Mm. So that's your four steps. To do that, you cannot be to, to uh, your mindfulness has to be sharp so that you can sense with observation and sensitivity. That's where you, Vipassana people are sensitive. That's where their sensitivity comes in. That was like basic training. Okay, now start using it all through life. The sensitivity of sensing something is happening in your body early. And I have people come from going, because sometimes in one retreat, they get all, all the way to Sakadagami. 
they go sodapana, sodapana fruition, sakadagami, sakadagami in fruition. Just like that, they go all the way through the path. How can they do that? When you see that happen, they're very sensitive to the tension and tightness. They have the ability to step back and be aware, examine everything impersonally. This is the scientific part of it. I told somebody today uh, this story about you can pretend that I'm hiring you for, oh, I don't know, $40,000 a year is a good starting salary, US, you know? And I'm hiring you as an assistant in a very important experiment. There's a big airplane hangar, and inside the airplane hangar, there's nothing in there except one table, and there's an aquarium sitting on the table, see? Inside the aquarium, there is an experiment. And your job, if you take this position, is to go into that airplane hangar and write down every day what it is you see that is new, that just happened, what is happening in that tank today, and you tell me what colors it is and the temperature, and that's all you do. But here's the deal. You have signed a clause in your contract, your agreement. If you start describing something like something you saw in the past, you can't stay, you can't work for me anymore. And the research is no good because the research is new and it has to be brand new. This is very odd, but this is what we're asking you to do, is let go of all your ideas, all of the other stuff. Go back and listen carefully to the Buddha, like in this sutta, but even more, and, and put together his terminology. Not all the terminology for the last, uh, uh, you know, 26, 2400 years or so after everybody was gone that was working with him, but try to go back to what he said and come up with terminology. And the terminology is only acceptable to use. You can come up with some if you want. Tell me what it is. We'll try it. We're very open-minded. We're always looking for what works really well. But the terminology has to be operational. It can't just be academic terminology that somebody assumes, you see. You have to track it and then apply it. And if it works, Let's try it with 200 people next time we do retreats. That's what we do. That's what we keep doing. So next one is the fork. The fork is a symbol of doubt. We talked about the doubt. That's just when you let other ideas come in to the instructions. That's what can get you confused. So stay just with the instructions. You should have them um, if you, if we need to give a copy of them to you, we will give you a copy of the instructions that he gave the first night that you listened in the retreat, if you're here, okay? And you read them over and you see the pinpointed pieces and you read them over and over and over again. And then you just to check and then you watch what you're doing. The sieve is a symbol of the five hindrances. We talked about the five hindrances. You are shaking the sieve to see that the five hindrances are like their root, uh, root hindrances. And then uh, what we found last year, when we examine Brahma Viharas, we find out the Buddha was teaching Rahula probably the four seeds of the five hindrances. Okay, if you want to take a picture of that, that board, you can take a picture of that board real quick. And then I'm going to erase it. Um, I don't know how to do a second board. Um, so I probably have to erase it. Yep. <laughs> so you get, you get what's going on here, smiling muscles. Lock the door to the library of reactions. Keep doing twim and you're reducing your tension down. And what is Nibbana? No tension and tightness at all. So where are you going? 
you are moving towards cessation. Why do they say it takes years and years and years and years and years to do it this other way? Because to me, when I look at the other practitioner, the only way he can go down there in these other levels is if accidentally he, for, he forgets and he accidentally kind of relaxes, then he'll make some progress. Without that letting go and just relaxing entirely, letting go of craving and any tension and tightness, he can't. So it's actually nobody's lying when they say that it could take you uh, five years or 10 years to get to the first jhana or 10, you know, 12 years to get to the second jhana, things like that. It's not a lie. If you're uptight and trying to make it happen, my goodness, it could take you the whole lifetime to get to Sotapanna for heaven's sakes. But when the car is not running, we go back to the car analogy, when a car is not running, or your bike, when it's not running, I, mean, I used to ride bikes too, yeah. You don't just keep riding the bike until it falls apart. You don't keep riding the car, driving in the car until it just plain falls apart. You fix it, you know? And when you're, when you're listening to car engines and truck engines, I've worked with a lot of equipment. You can hear what's wrong. You can hear, uh-oh, it's the oil. Oh my, it's the transmission fluid. Oops, look at that. We have to put more brake fluid in the, in the vehicle. Yeah, this is what you have to do. Those fluids have to be there at the right level for the engine to operate and for your brain to become its potential you have to learn how to keep the right level of tension or tightness in that mind, in the head. And the more that you remove, the more you open your mind to potentials. For what? For new, creative, peaceful solutions for just about everything in the world. If everybody would stop taking things personally and start cooperating, like Mr. Rogers used to say, that's cooperation. <laughs> if we were all cooperating with COVID, I mean really cooperating, not spitting in each other's faces and racing to get this and that. But there are event there are people who are cooperating. They're the ones that are gonna come with the vaccine. We'll see how much they cooperate by how much they charge. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that a lot of people are watching. Yeah. That's the whole part of that. So cooperation for the good of humanity, for the survival of the consumer, when there's businesses, there has to be consumers. You don't feed us, take care of us, make sure we're able to do that for ourselves. You won't have any economies anymore. So everybody has to work together. I think it's actually pretty good over here. People are trying, people are working and, and trying to do this. And each country has more difficulty or less difficulty as it goes along. Okay, so what was I doing over here? I erased that for a reason. Does anybody remember? <laughs> okay, so the five hindrances. Now the next one is the tortoise. Let's keep going. The tortoise is, um, I'll think of this again and I'll go back there in a minute. The tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates now, whenever in the text, whenever it says five aggregates affected by clinging, that's what it means, right? This is important. What this means is five aggregates if affected by clinging or when affected by clinging. Because if you're not clinging, is this paragraph true? Hmm. Nope. So if you're practicing twim and you're letting go of the personal concern and letting go of atta, you're practicing anatta, impersonal way of looking at these things, then you cannot say that um, these things are, are suffering unless 
you're personally involved with them. You set it off. Oh, this is a big awakening. You are in charge. You are in charge. But if you don't understand how it all operates, you won't believe me. You create your own life. Whoa. <laughs> you do. You create your own experience every single day. Are you going to decide to be happy? Or are you going to decide to let yourself get bogged down with sadness and worry and concern about this, concern about that, pulling you down? It's not, you, you don't skip these things. If you have to get something done for the house or pick something up, you pick it up. If it takes a long time, like it took us a long time today, then we start laughing. Just remember, laughing is something the human being can do and it actually is functional in the operation of the body system. This is what I want you to remember. Always, always remember that, okay? Namely, the hindrance essential desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, the hindrance of restlessness, guilt and remorse, the hindrance of doubt, if affected by clinging, it's a problem. So you throw out the sieve and abandon the hindrances. Stop being so concerned about all of them. Throw it all away. The hindrances really don't have, what the hindrances are good for is if they do come, you get to see that you did not ask them to come. You get to see how they impersonally arise. That's what they're good for. What they're not good for is what the Alagadupama Sutta tells you in section 10. I told Arati, I told you, when have you ever heard me say that the Dhamma that way, that you should ever engage it is what he's talking about. And he says to him, I have told you when an obstacle comes, it can only become an obstruction if you engage in it, it can't be any clearer than that. He said that directly to him. He was just as guilty as Sati, son of the fisherman. Well, this was Arati, the, the Arati's uh, son, uh, I mean, uh, Sati's problem was he thought consciousness keeps going, our consciousness keeps going, and we keep being reborn as the same person again and again, our consciousness. That's who we are, okay? Arati's problem was he's going to pay attention to his hindrances. And the Buddha stopped him in his tracks. He said, I've never said you should pay attention to any of these things that come up. The book is full of abandonment, relinquishment, release, and letting go, just letting it be. Understanding anicca, understanding whatever arises, it will be there, it will pass away, always and forever. I never said engage it. I have told you, do not engage the hindrance. That's what his directive was to the monks and Arati that day. And it's all about following instructions. That lesson was, I've given you the instructions to do what I say and you won't get burned. That's basically what it's saying. Now the butcher's knife and block is the next one. This is the five chords of pleasure. These are, what's he saying to that? He's saying, okay, this is the meaning. And so he's saying, throw out the butcher's knife and block. What's he talking about? Now, I wanna make something clear here. This doesn't mean you throw absolutely everything out the window. You mean, you know, we talk about uh, conventional reality and ultimate reality. One of the reasons we talk about it is to achieve a balance in our life that we can use our knowledge and uh, vision. We can use our knowledge and wisdom of what to do. You're, you have the wisdom to do this or do that, to crave and cling or not to crave and cling, to react or not to react. It's your choice. You have judgment. And when you're living with a family and in lay life, you do not attempt 
to not feel anything. You're suicidal in your relationships if you do this. You're destructive to your family structure if you do this. If you never laugh or giggle or tickle your kids, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. You need to have fun with your children and let them feel how light it is and how fun it is. You need to get on the floor, oh boy, when they're little. You know, I can't play horsey anymore. I used to say to my husband, you know, they want to ride the horse, ride the horse. They want you to play horsey with them when they're real little. You just, but you have to play with them. And these are good things. These are not bad things. What we're doing today, the confusion is we are trying to confuse the monk or the nuns, uh, the, the high level monks and nuns that are monastic, talking away from this and dedicating their lives, those that have decided to dedicate their lives to this path strictly all the time without any other jobs in the community that are making that kind of dedication, cut out everything and go for it. Not the lay person. If you think that you're gonna pursue this practice and go home and make your family happy and you can't rub anybody's back and get scratched and have scratch somebody and scratch their back and you're married to somebody and you're trying to pursue this and you think, there's something wrong. Why can't you just accept the fact I'm not going to speak about anything, say yes or no, or make a choice or a decision anymore. And I'm just not going to be uh, sweet and scratch your back or anything else. You're crazy. Because that's going to be trouble. Now that's something you have to iron out in your relationships if you're really going to go for everything all the way. You need to make a decision, but to do it within the family structure, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And there is a kind of urge. The one reason they talk about the Arahat, for instance, can die in seven days if he doesn't go into the, into the uh, pure Sangha. Did you hear me say pure Sangha? That he can go into the pure song. Why? Because if he goes in the pure song and he starts talking about what happened, how happy he is that he has done this and he lets the, the wholesomeness flow out of him, they understand what's happening. But if you're around a bunch of people that don't understand what's happening, you could end up in the loony bin. This is not unheard of. When people get very quiet, they want to live by themselves, but they're not upset. And then the other person wants to get rid of them. They say, well, they're mentally disturbed. Put them in some place. This has happened, you know, just because they're quiet. And, you know, people think, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm, this is all I do all the time. But, you know, I don't reject anybody. If they want to come for help and they want to talk to me, that's fine, but I don't pursue anything having to do, and they know that, my family, anymore, okay? But the point here is that um, there's nothing wrong with somebody deciding, you know what I discovered? It's really nice to be alone. In this world, do you think that the, ma the mass of population and and, and society accepts that as normal? They don't. And they, they would say the person is very eccentric at the very least. And they could go a lot further to try to give them medication so they'll come out and be more friendly. And they're not interacting enough to satisfy the medical community. And it goes on and on and on. But if a person does decide they want to be alone and they like being alone, and they like to live like that, there's nothing wrong with it. But you understand the angst that does happen. It's not angst in the arahat or angst in the person that had the higher attainment. The angst comes from figuring out, my goodness, where are you supposed to live? How do I figure this out? Once you get to that place, how do you do it? So that you can speak to people that are interested in this and converse and teach and work. And I, I don't have any trouble with that. There's so many of you now that, you know, I can talk to people all over the world. I call our deacon Bernaziroff. 
you know, or somebody you know who can let me think out loud about a sutta or a subject matter. But if I do that with an average person, a uh, big problem. So, all right. So this is this is the part about the. Um, you're basically saying the butcher's knife and block, you're letting go of the uh, desire, the wished for and desired agreeable and likable connected with sensual desire. This sensual desire is worldly desire. This is dangerous for the practice, but there's, there's balances here. And if you learn to make, and you're in cooperation with your brain, you play with the kids, then go in the room, sit down, be quiet, be alone and you have really good sitting, that's how it works, yeah? Okay. So the last one is about the piece of meat is the symbol for delight and lust. Throw out the piece of meat, abandon delight and lust, delve with the knife. This is the meaning. The Naga serpent is a symbol for the bhikkhu who has destroyed the taints. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Maga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. This is the meaning. This is what the Blessed One said in the Venerable Kumara Kasapa. He was satisfied and he was delighted in the Buddha's words. Now, Kasapa, the name Kasapa is an interesting name. You know, because we hear Kasapa bouncing around in the texts here. I'm not sure about this. That I was going to look at this the other day. Um, but if you go in the back of Bhikkhu Bodhi's um, Majjhima Nikaya, there's a section in there for names. There were five Kasapas involved with the, uh, with the uh, Buddha. Five, five of them, and I think three were brothers. I'm not sure if the other ones were related. But um, I had someone who knew all the stories for everything. He was a monk from Nepal, and he knew, he knew all the stories about everybody. And when you look up Kasapa, of course there was Buddha Kasapa. Now I'm not seeing it here. I have to go somewhere else to find it. Um, again, like when you get to a spot like this, you have the little green book I told you about. You know the green one? Yeah, and this green one, if we look up Kasapa, this one, if we look up Kasapa in this book, oh, I love that one, I should. <laughs> you can't see the book, isn't this funny? Because my backdrop is green and the book is green. <laughs> What's the name of the book, sister? The, the Buddha and his teachings, and it's by Narada. And you can get this book at the corporate body of the Buddha Educational Foundation in Taiwan. The Taiwan, um, that one. That they print books for us. If we write stuff, we can turn it into them. And if we raise a little bit of money, they'll print it and make a donation. They'll print thousands and thousands of them. And that's how Bhante's book originally happened. Let me see if I can find Kasapa in this. I did it once, I think. Yeah, Kasapa Brothers. Here you go. There's Kasapa, and then there's Kasapa Brothers. And so on page 111 in this book, 111, you can find um, the story of these Kasapa Brothers. Mm. Mm. The conversion of the three Kasapa brothers. Wandering from place to place in due course, the Buddha arrived at Uruvela. And here he lived for uh, three ascetics with matted hair known as Uruvela Kasapa, Nadi Kasapa, and Gaya Kasapa. They were all brothers living separately with 500, 300, and 200 disciples, respectively. The eldest one was infatuated by his own spiritual attainments. He was laboring under a misconception that he was an arahant. The Buddha approached him first and sought his permission to spend the night in his fire chamber where dealt a fierce serpent king. By his psychic powers, the Buddha subdued the serpent. 
That basically means he stared down a cobra, probably, you know. And this uh, pleased Oravella Kasapa, and he invited the Buddha to stay there as his present guest. The Buddha was compelled to exhibit his psychic powers on several occasions to impress the ascetic, but still he adhered to his beliefs. He was trying to get him to see that if you are an Arahat, now it, I want to be sure you understand, if you are an Arahat, it doesn't mean everybody has all of the psychic powers that were Arahats. That wasn't how it worked. Some only developed the divine eye or the divine ear that developed and the other parts didn't develop. It's not something that always happens because you have a sensitive person and you have the intellectual person. And only the sensitive person is the one where all of them are likely to come out. So this, um, then, um, okay, so he says, uh, he exhibited that, okay, finally the Buddha was able to convince him that he, he was, uh, that he was an Arahant. And thereupon he and his followers entered at the order and um, he obtained the higher ordination. His brothers and the other followers also followed his example and accompanied by the three Kasapa brothers and their thousand followers, the Buddha rep repaired to Gaya Sisa, not far from Uruvela. And here he preached the Adida Pariyaya Sutta, hearing uh, which all attained Arashapship. All 1,000 of those uh, students attained Arahatship. Sometimes we find a person where the door is just ready to just open. It's like a flower that is, you buy it at the flower shop, you know, it's a bud. Do you ever do this? You buy uh, four or five roses and one of them goes like this the first night, just like that, you know? But the other ones don't open, they are real slow or sluggish in that way. And that's the way the students are. One time we had a student that came in South Carolina, her first retreat in her whole life. She showed up and she, they, we were, they were allowed to wear white if they wanted to. And she came with a white sheet and she put it on. And I looked at her and I said, who showed you how to put the robe on? She said, no one. And she was walking around for a whole week with the robe on and the robe never fell off. <laughs> and she had it on perfectly, absolutely perfectly. And she knew from another lifetime, she knew. And within two days of that retreat, she fell into the fourth jhana, only two days. And the reason was really because it, it seemed obvious she'd done this before, but not in this lifetime but she kept her precepts perfectly. And this is what made it so she was able to do this. She really told us she kept them all her life perfectly. And that's what happened. So um, this is really um, like the little notation place to go, this book to find answers about each person. So I wanna hear questions and about anything that's going on in your, about the sutta, but also I want to hear any questions that are going on in reference to uh, just your practices. What's happening? Somebody say something, okay. <laughs> How are you doing with everything? Hmm? Great, sister. Yeah, Effendi? Oh, I'm sorry, is Ardika said that? Oh, yes. Effendi. It was Ardika. Okay. Ardika, go first. I think Effendi no, no, has no. a question. Give it oh, to okay, Effendi, go first. <gasps> For after you, after you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Effendi, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thank you, sister. Uh, the sutta mentioned about uh, delving. Uh, and uh, arousing the of oh, energy like that. Uh, so I wonder, is it uh, it is if it is the same with virya, and 
what I understand about Wiria is you have to work hard like that. Uh, or is it? Wait, wait. Let's not get confused. Delving when you're delving in, delving into the ant hill. The ant hill is like shaped like this, right? And you're delving. You're digging. Delving is digging. I want you to go into the forest. I want you to collect a certain mushroom. You will find it at the root of the tree, this kind of tree, and it's three inches. Delve in with your tool and get the mushroom root. Be sure you don't pull it out without the root. That's what I would say to somebody. Delving is digging, okay? Uh, so uh, how did you connect it? Tell me how you connected that with energy. Yeah, because I, I read the, the sutta, they said about the, the link that Ad Adhika said, uh, they said about arousing of energy. So is it the same with uh, Wiriya or is it different? Which, which section are you on the sutta? Are you in the, are you in the Majima Nikaya? It's number four, sister. It's... Uh the paragraph number yep. uh, not paragraph but it's the point number four okay says, tell me the page tell me says, the page uh, it's uh one uh two three eight two three eight two three eight okay yeah and it's number four let's and go back and find it let's go back and find it okay and just on the bottom okay. there does the yep. it says there the brahmin is symbol for the tathagata Right. And fully enlightened. The wise one is a symbol for a bhikkhus in higher training. Right. Life is a symbol for noble wisdom. The delving right. is a symbol for the arousing of energy. Maybe this is the okay. one that he okay. was right. talking okay, about. Okay, stop. The arousing of energy to keep your practice going all the time. This is arousing of energy. You have to have energy to keep your practice going all the time. You have these sets of things. Um, let's, let's look at something, look at one of the work charts we use. Um, if we go into here and, and share the board, um, we would see you have, um, we ha what, what I want you to look at is the 37 requisites of awakening. I want you to see the groups, right? So first you have um, uh, the four foundations. Then you have, you have four, 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 five, five, seven, eight. That's what you have. So four foundations of mindfulness, right? We know what that practice is in Satipatthana. Four steps of right effort. Four powers, spiritual powers, spiritual powers. Okay, five faculties, five powers seven factors and eight folds, eight fold path. Now I'm gonna show you some things that really, I, uh, I really dug up over the years and see this, this, this way. I want you to be able to, um, let me get rid of this a minute. I want you to see a couple things on the chart. Let's look at the, let's draw a line here and see, I don't know if I can fit it because usually I used to do this on a great big piece of paper on the floor <laughs> or on a great big blackboard, you know? So let me see if I can do it. So four pounds, you, you have an examination of body feeling, mind, dhammas, okay? Next one, you know what this is. You uh, recognize 
release. Um, and what this is, that this is about unwholesome and wholesome mind states. That's what this is about, four steps of right effort. Very specific. Recognize it, release it, uh, relax. Smile. Come back. And repeat. Or continue. You can say continue. All right, four spiritual powers. Oh, I, I, they always have trouble with this. <laughs> Uh, but there's an energy, I know there's an energy one in here. I never can, for some reason, I never can memorize. I have to make myself do that this year. Okay, five pack, faculties are easy, easy to remember. It's, there's a little thing, there's a, a mnemonic way of remembering faculties and powers. Both of these, right? You say, you say this, you say these letters. Fem, qua. Say femme qua, right? And what it is, is faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, concentration, and wisdom. Okay, wisdom. Now over here. Now, so you have this twice. You have, you have faith again, energy again, mindfulness again. You have um, concentration and you have wisdom again. All right. Now you have seven factors. Seven factors are mindfulness. And then you have investigation. energy joy and then on the other side you have tranquility um concentrate no is that yeah concentration is that right concentration and equanimity Concentration and equanimity. I'm just going to put equa like that, okay? And then you got the eightfold path. And so the first one, uh, the first one is um, we'll do we'll do it with the old words so everybody gets it real quick. But the first one, well, the way to remember the new ones. I'll tell you the way to remember the new words is to say this name. Pick them. L Pock. <laughs> there you go. All right. His name is Pickham L Pock. First one is perspective. Perspective. Imaging. The images that you keep in your head. Communication. That's speech, but it's also the movement, the positions, your expressions, everything. This one is movement of attention. And the reason, you know, we, if we, if some, maybe I'll spend some time, try to do a short one next time so I can take you through the whole eightfold path afterwards. We'll do that next Saturday, okay? Let's, somebody has to remind me that we're gonna do this. But if you teach the Eightfold Path up close, you begin to see why these are changed the way they are. Instead of, um, instead of um, your jobs, just talking about don't get involved in killing or poison or human slavery, we say lifestyle. We make it larger than that. If you were talking about the conventional reality, you could just say those three things. But when you are talking the ultimate reality, where you live is very important if you're going to keep your practice going. And it's not 
the level you live or anything like that. It's that you find one little place on your property or in your house that you can say when you're sitting there and you put like you put a scarf on your head like that, nobody can speak to you. You just can meditate. Nobody's going to bother you. It's your spot. You try to have a little spot in the house. Okay, and then you have, um, let's see, pick a male part. So we turned right effort into the word practice. And we took, um, we took, um, what was it? Mindfulness, and we turned it into what it really is, is observation. It's a special kind of observation that is connected with the meditation. And then the last one, uh, pick a milpak, so you have another C down here. And that one was your concentration. We changed it to collectedness. This is really awful, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe I can type it out for you someday. So if you look at this picture of all these pieces over here, I forget. Um, you know, Ardika, can you look up spiritual powers? And I can't remember which sutta is in. It's in. Uh, and tell me what the, you have to find the word energy and then tell me what the other words are in the same sentences. And that's what the, the four spiritual powers. That's in. What they, one is energy. Okay, what, what's the, what are the other ones? Can you find it? No. Um, second, it's supposed to be in the 52. Um, Is it 52? Uh, in 50, 52? Ritual. Yeah, it's supposed to be in 52. Majimanikaya 52. Um, let me check. 52. No, Are you something. asking me the, the, the Pali words or the English words? No, no. What is it in English? You know, the four, it, see the spiritual powers, what the spiritual powers are, you develop the approach. Energy, concentration, with mindfulness and wisdom. Oh, good. Do it again. Do it again, Doc. What is it? Uh, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Concentration. Concentration or wisdom? And mm. wisdom? Okay. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was another action word. I don't wait, know about the wisdom. It's supposed to be something else. Oh, is that supposed to be uh, the intention, um, energy. Um, wait, I know it's. And investigation? No, that's a different one. Wait a second. I'll find. You know, it's really hard to remember this one because it's not so obvious like the other ones. Let me try one thing. Is uh, considered the four basis? No, right? No, uh, no. Wait a minute. You might be right. Wait just a second. Um, the ED pada. It's you just see page number six thirty-seven. It's on six thirty-seven. Yeah, page number six thirty-seven. Last last paragraph. Oh, it's good. That's good. That's really good job. Thirty-seven. It's four, it's not five. Five powers. You are asking for five. No, the powers. Uh -huh. It no, says five. No, 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 no. That's faculties and powers. That's not spiritual powers. Wait a second. It is in this, it yeah, is here. In it's 17. In yeah. Uh, okay. Six, 637 at the top of the page. Four bases of spiritual power. One is um, is enthusiasm, determination, yeah, investigation, well, investigation. Uh, so Ener due to you take the word due to and okay. One of them is enthusiasm. The second one is energy. The third one is purity of mind, and the fourth one is um, investigation. Investigation and determined striving. Yeah. Okay. That's much to write there. <laughs> See what I mean? This is tricky. I mean, this is really, this is tricky. Let's try and.
put some kind of word here. But, okay. Um, but in... Okay. You, when you read the sentence, it, you have to read it carefully. You read this, I'll show you how you do it because it took me a long time. You look at 637, it's number 17. The third one is four bases of spiritual power. Now listen to how it works. Again, you, Diane, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four bases of spiritual power. Now here's the sentence. Um, a bhikkhu develops a basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to enthusiasm and determined striving. So it's due to, it's, I'm sorry, we may, concentration due to, and zeal is enthusiasm. So we say enthusiasm and determined striving. He develops the basis of spiritual power consisting in concentration due to energy and determined striving. So first one is, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. the first it's support piece is the enthusiasm and determined striving. The second, it's due to energy and determined to strive. Ener I'm sorry, energy. No, that's not right. I'm doing it wrong again. Very hard to figure this out. He develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to purity of mind. Oh, this is okay. I see. In Pali, it is Chanda, Chitta, Virya, and Mimansa. Hmm. See. Okay, Chanda is enthusiasm, Virya is energy, yeah. Chitta is Chitta is concentration, and Vimansa is investigation. Okay. So they so they opted to opted to call concentration. But in but in here it's concentrate a oh, concentration. All right, try it again. Say it one mm -hmm. more time, Doc. Yeah, Samadhi, Chanda, Virya, and Chitta. All right, we're going to put the poly down. <laughs> And get away with that. All right. Oh, oops, wait a minute. We have to write. Chanda, Virya, Chitta, and Vimamsa. Chitta and Samadhi are same. Chanda, Virya, Chitta, and Vimamsa. Chanda, the second yeah. one is what? Chanda, Virya, Virya, Chitta, and Vimamsa. Chitta. Hmm. And, v and what's the last one? Vimamsa. The M V I M A M S A Vimamsa. So okay, Vimamsa. There you go, right here. Mm. Now, what I was going to show Effendi was, you see, it's where energy, faith, energy happens here, energy happens here, energy happens here, and. Um, Energy is involved in the practice. It's involved in the practice of the twim. And it also, the energy occurs inside the practice in the Eightfold Path and in every, all the stuff you do. So when we're talking, when we were talking about what was Effendi's question, I'm way far away from your question. What, what were we saying about the anthill? <laughs> this is how it works when we go through this. So when you when you look at that whole chart you see how there's repetition of things and you're looking at them from dis different aspects when you see the repetition on a chart like that let's go back a second when you look at charts when they're spread out like this you begin to see that there's repetition of certain things like how many times does mindfulness happen in this thing there's another one for when another way to look at it is where mindfulness is. Okay, so mindfulness is here. And we found mindfulness down here. And actually mindfulness was in here because it was in um, mm -hmm. It was here. The observation is what it is, right? This is mindfulness too. You see how it happens? It's scattered all through. So you can't, one of the things I was discussing with somebody this week, this is interesting. 
This said, why do people think this is so hard to understand? You seem to think it's pretty easy to, to understand. It is easy to understand, but right now we're working with a group of people working in Buddhism who have spent a long time cubbyholing it. Do you understand what a cubbyhole is? You, do you ever go to a, mail, a post office and there's little boxes, you know, boxes for people to get their mail? They took Buddhism, and actually, this is one of the things that happened in the map in the main commentary. He took when he organized that book, he wanted to take every single tiny piece. So, when we look at him and say, Who was he that he would do this like this? Um, he, he didn't quite, it was all very different to him when he was studying Kali. He's not a meditator. Buddha Gosa was an academic and he came from, he did meditate when he was growing up in the Brahmin system and the Brahmin system was the ascetic system and the ascetic system was one point of concentration and it had that old idea back then, if we give the body enough pain, then the mind will open. <laughs> and the Buddha tried this for years. If you want, do you want to understand how much he did that? Because when, when we spend time looking in the front, uh, in section, let's see, we go to 20, go to 20, number 20. And let's just read, I won't read the whole thing, but let's read just a little bit of what happened. No, I said 20, no, it's 36. I'm sorry. Go to 36. In 36, in this front section of 36, you have to understand what 36 was first. 36 was a, was a suit where the Buddha was explaining to the monks, I'm going to tell you what I did. I'm going to tell you how I did it, how hard I worked for six years, and I'm going to tell you everything I don't want you to do. That's what 36 is. It's a really important sutta. We don't hear, hear it very often. Bhante will do it sometimes. You listen to what he did in, in this section where it really starts explaining it. Oh my gosh, you cannot understand how hard he was practicing. He, he says, I thought, uh, let's see, how to start. Me suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearlessly. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, neighbors and nagas, 